today with Steve Roberts. Really exciting to see some, a lot of familiar faces and a lot of new faces join us today on VMR. So today's a very special VMR, one of our subspecialty VMR specifically um, focusing on cardiology today. Um, and to everyone, some people that don't know me, I'm Gurleen, I'm an internal medicine intern at Brigham in Boston. And we're so thrilled to have Dr. Kittleson here with us today at CP Solvers. I'm sure everyone knows Dr. Kittleson from her Kittleson rules on Twitter, as well as all the teaching and pearls that she shares on her Twitter account, as well as all the other roles that she plays in education and cardiology. So she is a heart failure and transplant cardiologist at Cedar sinai I was actually um, just talking to her about how she's also an alum of the Brigham Residency Program. So thank you so much, Dr. Kittleson, for being with us today. And we're so excited to get to discuss cardiology with you and learn from all your pearls and from the case that Laura has prepared for us today. So I'll pass on the mic to Dr. Kittleson to introduce herself, and then we can go around and have Laura introduce herself, as well as Marcella and Shima, who will be helping us with scribing and teaching points. Oh, thank you so much. I am delighted to be here. I love CP solvers, and uh, I'm a heart failure transplant cardiologist uh, in sunny Los Angeles, and I'm going to tell you guys a story. I haven't been to Grand Rounds in gosh, decades, because I'm not a cool resident anymore, but I'm going to tell you about the one time I shined, I shone at Grand Rounds, uh, I mean, at, at Morning Report, at Morning Report when I was a resident. The case was someone who had an ERCP and then had uh, hematemesis and jaundice, and I said, could it be hemobilia? And that was like the one time in my whole life I ever won morning report. And I can tell you for certain, the answer is not gonna be hemobilia here, but, but at least to make you feel better, if you feel like you never know the answer at morning report, that was me as a resident. Who's next? <laughs> we'll pass it on to um, Laura. Yeah, it's me. Hi everyone, um, I'm Laura. I'm a fourth year medical student from, from Brazil. And I'm super excited to be here today. I'm so happy that Dr. Kittison is here. Um, I'm honestly a fan. I love the hashtag tips for new docs. I literally bookmark every single post. I love it because her tips are practical, but thoughtful and sensible and I love it. And yeah, Marcella, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi everyone, my name is Marcela. I'm a doctor from Brazil and I'm so excited to be here. I'll be scribing uh, and now I pass the mic to Shema, my friend. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Shema and I'm a, and now a fifth year medical student from Germany and I'm very happy to join you all and very excited for the case. I pass the mic, mic to Rafa. Oh, I'm not supposed to introduce myself. <laughs> no, Dor, Dor, actually, I want to make a question to Dr. Kittison. Why did you choose cardiology? Um, and what do you do for fun outside of medicine? Um, oh, so the first question is, why did I choose cardiology? What was the second question? What do you do for fun outside of medicine? Okay, so I chose cardiology for three reasons. My dad happens to be a cardiologist, and that's not why I chose it. I wanted to rebel, but <laughs> I wasn't able to rebel that much. So I chose it because number one, the history and physical exam are still critically important to a cardiologist. You can't diagnose unstable angina without a history. You can't diagnose decompensated heart failure without a physical exam. I love that. Second is the evidence base. The evidence base in cardiology is extraordinary. When you tell a patient you think they should do something, there's actually amazing evidence to support that recommendation. And number three, this is gonna sound a little strange, but I emotionally watching people pass away from cardiac disease is something I can manage emotionally. I find patients dying of cancer to be just too much to wrap my brain around. Whereas I feel I can somehow make more sense of the tragedies of cardiology. So those are the three reasons why I chose cardiology. What do I do for fun outside of the hospital? Well, it turns out I'm also a wild animal wrangler and zookeeper. Not really, but I have three kids, ages five, seven, and 10. So that's what it feels like most of the time. Thanks so much for sharing, Dr. Kittleson. And yeah, I think cardiology is just so fun because of the physical exam findings and all the hemodynamics. I'm actually in the CC right now. And there's just so many like physiology and all the things that we learn in med school that we can like really apply day to day with patient care. So that's been really fun. 
we can go ahead and get started with the case. And I think Marcella will be sharing her screen and then Laura, you can start um, the first owl call whenever we have the whiteboard up. Okay. Okay, so um, the chief complaint is fatigue and exertional dyspnea. So it is a 74 year old man presenting with a two month history of fatigue and exertional dyspnea. He used to walk three miles daily, but has cut back over the past um, few months, initially limited by back pain, but now also due to shortness of breath. He denies chest discomfort or palpitations. He has position, positional lightheadedness, but no syncope. He had been on Lozartan 100 milligrams daily, and it was reduced to 25 milligrams daily due to orthostasis. He denies orthopnea or paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, but has noted ankle edema at the end of the day. He denies cough. For the past medical history, um, he had um, coronary artery, artery disease. 10 years prior, he presented with angina and had a stress test showing anterior ischemia, resu resulting in angiogram and um, left anterior descending artery percutaneous interventions. Also, atrial fib fibrillation status, post ablation five years prior with six sinus syndrome requ requ requiring pacemaker, polymyalgia, rheumatica, diagnosed six months prior on a slow prednisone taper, carpal tunnel syndrome, bilateral with surgery three years prior, and lumbar spinal stenosis with surgery eight years prior. And I'll stop here. My turn now to talk. Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. You can share. You can share what you think about the aliquot okay. and kind of how you're thinking about this case with the cardiologist focus. Okay, fantastic. So first, I want to say. I like this HPI and this PMH. I'm such a stickler because I think how you present uh, affects how you think and how you think prevents how you uh, affects how you present. So if you think clearly, you speak clearly, if you speak clearly, you think clearly. It's a, it's a good feedback loop. And I like that we start with baseline. He was doing just fine, but now this two months kind of a gradual decline. That's really important. I like that the past medical history is really nicely stratified, not just one coronary artery disease, two atrial fibrillation. No, let me tell you about the coronary disease. It was just kind of not a major deal. He had a little bit of angina. It's not like he didn't have a massive STEMI. That's important. And the AFib, well, is it still there? Is it not there? What do they do about it? So I, I like all these details. So let's start with our uh, differential diagnosis of exertional dyspnea. Now, I had a mentor in medical school who always said to me, don't memorize, right? Reason, start with your pathophysiology and let your pathophysiology guide your etiology, which guides your differential diagnosis. So if we think about what makes people short of breath, well, it could be something with the heart, which of course we will talk about in much more excruciating detail. It could be the lungs, could be anemia, could be something like deconditioning. So if it's the heart, which of course it has to be the heart because I'm a cardiologist, then I break it down by structure. Could be the heart muscle, could be the heart arteries, could be the heart valves, could be the electrical system, right? All the components that comprise the heart. And I suppose you could add the pericardium. So just think of what the heart's made of and any problem with those things could make you short of breath. Um, and then your differential diagnosis is also weighted by your past history, right? Because your differential diagnosis in a 20-year-old isn't going to be weighted the same as a 74-year-old. So let's break it down. Then we've got the heart muscle. There could be a cardiomyopathy. It could either have a reduced ejection fraction or a preserved ejection fraction. You could probably want an echo to figure that out. What about the arteries? Well, coronary artery disease. There's lots of different types of coronary artery disease. There could be atherosclerotic, there could be thrombotic, there could be dissection. Well, he's a little old to get a random coronary artery dissection, right? That would be more like a young woman. Thrombotic, well, we have nothing to suggest he's got some kind of hypercoagulable thing, but atherosclerotic, Look, at, think about his past history. He already had something 10 years ago. So maybe he'll need a stress test or a coronary CT angiogram or an invasive angiogram, put that in the back of our minds. 
Valve disease, could he have aortic stenosis, aortic regurgitation, mitral regurgitation, the three most common lesions to make you short of breath? Well, an echo is going to help with that. What about electrical disease? Well, conduction disease could do it, bradyarrhythmias, atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. Probably a pacemaker interrogation might offer some insight here. So my take home, when I think about a patient with prior coronary disease and atrial fibrillation, once I hear his history, I'm focused on, could this be coronary disease? Could this be some kind of arrhythmia, either Brady or tacky, related to his prior history of AFib and sick sinus syndrome? Great, thank you so much. I love how you um, explored all the other systems besides the cardiovascular system as well. Because when we're thinking about chief complaint of shortness of breath, there's always that wider differential with all the different organ systems. And now when you're kind of, well, in the next aloqua, I think we'll hear about the physical exam. When you're thinking about this patient, what are like some things that you are specifically looking for in the physical exam? Yes. So um, I think, um, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's always, it's experience that really guides you on what you weight in your differential. So what I care about, I care about the jugular venous pulse. And I think that's a skill that is so crucially important no matter what you go into, because if you see an elevated jugular venous pressure, something very unusual is happening to that patient. You know, listening, are they regular or irregular? I guess it's sort of helpful. An S3 gallop, always a very bad sign. You can't even convince me an S3 ever occurs in a good situation. And then the lung exam, generally I find the lung exam incredibly useless for telling me if someone's in heart failure, right? Because it's neither sensitive nor specific. You can have upregulation of the pulmonary lymphatics and chronic heart failure, whereby you won't have any crackles when you have an extremely high wedge pressure. You can also have crackles just because you've had electasis and you haven't taken a deep breath and you need to cough some more. I saw a patient once years ago who was sent to me for decompensate for refractory heart failure. EF was 30%. And you know, something about her story just didn't quite fit. The, the, the rhythm of her the trajectory didn't feel right. And then I listened to her lungs and I heard the finest of crackles, fine, fine everywhere. I'm like, this is very strange. The lungs never sound like this in heart failure. Then I looked at her chest x-ray and there's these bilateral fluffy infiltrates everywhere. And, I, and it turned out she had an interstitial lung disease. Bad news for her, but it just goes to show that the physical exam can help you rule in and rule out if you have a heightened awareness for these things. So lung exam and um, not to rule in heart failure, but a rule in something else, jugular venous pressure, and then S3, are they sick or not? Great. And then Laura, we'll turn it back to you for the second aloqua. Amazing. That was brilliant. Um, okay, so for the meds, um, he was taking aspirin, 81 milligrams daily, atorvastatin, 40 milligrams daily, losartan, 25 milligrams daily, retinazone, 4 milligrams daily. For the family history, his father passed away in his sleep at the age of 61. The cause of death was presumed to be a heart attack. And for the social history, he was born and raised in Chicago and is a retired civil engineer. He lives at home with his wife, has two children, two grandchildren, and has never smoked cigarettes, um, does not drink alcohol or use illicit drugs. And it's your turn again, please, Dr. Kudison. So um, a couple points here. Uh, first of all, I, the social history, I don't think tells you very much, but I just love a good social history. I had a uh, attending once when I was a fellow and, and, and we were on the cardiology consult service together. And the first thing he would want to know is where's the patient born and raised? And so I learned very quickly to ask every patient where they were born and raised. And then he would take an atlas off his bookshelf and we'd, oh, we'd look, oh, look at that tiny town east of Baltimore. I never knew it was even there. And then it was a lovely way just to make life interesting, learn more about your patients, and it only takes like five seconds. So that's that's why I, I, I just love having it. I like to know what people do for a living. So um, now let's get to clues, clinical clues based on the med, social history, family history. It is interesting, isn't it, that his symptoms may have started while on prednisone, which could have caused fluid retention, which now makes cardiomyopathy, maybe we're thinking about that on our differential. And this reduction in Losartan dose is interesting. What's the natural history of hypertension? It gets worse as you get older. How weird to be a 74-year-old guy need less blood pressure medicine, not more? That tells me something funny, like a cardiomyopathy maybe going on or some kind of, why it's got this orthostasis. And then family history. 
is not always clear. What does a heart attack really mean? Does it mean that his was it a myocardial infarction? Was it old age? Was it an arrhythmia? You know, heart attack to a lay person can mean about 17 different things minimum. So, and you know, at 74, he's kind of old for a hereditary condition. So I'm kind of just putting that in the back of my mind and not putting too much weight on a hereditary thing yet. Great. We can turn it back to Laura for the next hour class. Okay, so um, we'll go to the physical exam, the vitals, heart rate 92, blood pressure 106 over 80, oxygen saturation 95 on room air. Um, he, he looked thin, no distress. Um, in the neck, JVP 12, 12 centimeters, um, chest, lungs clear to auscultation, cardiac. Um, regular rate and rhythm, no murmurs, um, S4 gallop present, abdomen soft, non-tender, no organomegaly, um, extremities warm with trace ankle edema for the labs. Marcel, do you want me to wait for you or is, or is it okay? Is it okay? It's okay, you can keep okay. going. Um, sodium 140. Um, Potassium 4.5, creatinine 1.3, with estimated glomerular filtration rate of 50, white blood count 5.6, hemoglobin 11.2, platelets um, 210, troponin 1 0.3, and BNP 540. And that's you again, please. So what has the physical exam and the laboratories told us? What light have they shed on this perplexing situation of a 74-year-old man with exertional dyspnea? You know, that JVP, that is not normal, right? What's a normal jugular venous pressure? Maybe four, six centimeters of water? Something funny is going on here. So already, I'm, I'm very, I'm even more interested. I'm not saying, oh, it's just deconditioning, blah, blah, blah. Something is not right. Something has made that JVP go up. And I'm narrowing my differential more to say, well, is this a cardiomyopathy? Um, and then this S4 gallop, well, he's clearly must be in sinus, so the uh, uh, ablation worked to some extent, but, um, you know, because he's got an S4 atrial kick, but why is his heart so stiff? Stiff hearts give us an S4 gallop. And the labs are, you know, benign, his creatinine's okay, you know, his age and all. Why has he got this little troponin leak? He doesn't look like he's having an ischemic event in before my eyes. And that BNP being elevated tells me now I'm really focusing. I'm less interested in an arrhythmia driving all of this. I suppose CAD is still on my differential because of that troponin, but why is the JVP up? Why does he have an S4 gallop? Why is this BNP elevated? I'm thinking now more of a cardiomyopathy. Great. And then when you're, we have some initial labs here and kind of what it would be your next labs that you would want next steps of imaging, kind of how do you think about the next diagnostic tests in the situation? I mean, my money is going to be on an echocardiogram. Um, I think Laura's going to tell us some other uh, standard imaging stuff first, but I really, really want to know what's going on with that echocardiogram. Um, actually, um, do you want to share your screen, Dr. Kittison, yeah. so that you can show us the images? Yes, I'll show you. Should I, should I show the EKG and the chest X-ray? Yeah. Or, okay, great. Actually, you can show um, all of them, like the okay. EKG, the neck chest X-ray, angiogram, and then echocardiogram, if that's... Got it. Okay, so now we can return to the mini mental status portion of this where I have to remember how to share my screen. Okay, hang on a second. Remember, kids, I'm not as I'm not as young as you. All these new skills I have to learn. Okay, so I share screen, and if I talk out loud while I'm doing it, it's actually much easier for me. Uh, and I hit share, and you can see the EKG. Yes. Yes, you can see it. Okay, tomato, tomato. Okay, so what do we see here? Well, okay, it's sinus rhythm. I mean, there's some lateral ST depressions. I, I don't think this really tells you first degree AV block. I, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not so excited. I don't, I don't feel like I'm gonna rush him off to the cath lab because of this EKG. I actually don't have a representative image of the angiogram. 
but he did actually get taken to the cath lab and lo and behold, the LAD stent was patent and there was nothing else going on, making us even more confused about this troponin. What is going on with that troponin? Okay, so EKG, not very exciting. Um, chest X-ray, I mean, it looks all right. He's got a pacemaker. We expect him to have a pacemaker. Um, the enlarged cardiac silhouette, again, I'm not so excited. So before you fall asleep in the middle of my presentation, let me show you something exciting. Now I have something exciting to show you. Look at that echocardiogram. Okay, so for those of you who don't read echocardiograms day in and day out like I do, the image on the left is the parasternal long axis view and you're seeing the uh, septum and the posterior wall of the left ventricle. The image on the right is what I think is the easiest way to conceptualize the heart, where you have the left ventricle, which is on the right side, because we always see you know, patient focus, and then the right ventricle, left atrium, right atrium. And what you see here, what I see here, is that those walls are quite thick, 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 thick walls. And when you think about thick walls of the heart, you say, ah, and if you look at a report of an echocardiogram, it says left ventricular hypertrophy. There's also some right ventricular hypertrophy here. But let me emphasize to you that left ventricular hypertrophy presumes that you know why these walls are thick. And you don't. You don't know if it's muscle. That would be the definition of hypertrophy. So a better way to put it is increased LV and RV wall thickness. And then um, just to... Uh, Let's see, am I gonna be able, oh my gosh, I'm just so excited that I figured out how to put a video <laughs> into a PowerPoint presentation. So I'm gonna just show you how it looks. I mean, it's squeezing fine, it's, but it's not a normal heart. This is no, 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 not a normal heart. Something very funny is going on. Okay, so those are my images. Um, all right, so now, uh, can I, should I chat, Laura, about the echocardiogram some more? Yes, yes. go okay. on, please. So yes, that was the money shot. EF, a little reduced, but the walls are thick. So now let's think about why the walls are thick. And you should always remember, like I said, the differential diagnosis of increased LV wall thickness, it's not always left ventricular hypertrophy. So there's two major reasons why the walls can be thick. It's more heart muscle, that would be LVH, or it's something infiltrating into the heart muscle. Okay, if it's more muscle, going back to our pathophysiology, that either comes from increased load because the heart, like any other muscle, increases in response to more load. So more load could come from hypertension, aortic stenosis, athlete's heart, or the more muscle can come from no source. That would be the very definition of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So more muscle, hypertension, aortic stenosis, athlete's heart, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But the second major category would be something's infiltrating into that muscle. Well, what's going to infiltrate into that muscle? So you memorize like a hundred things in medical school, but then once you're um, more experienced, you can then weight that differential of a hundred potential infiltrative cardiomyopathies into the ones that are most likely in an adult. There's Dannon cardiomyopathy, a glycogen storage disease. There's Fabre's, a glycolipid storage disease. But those would affect other things and generally present at a younger age. Like Dannon, you probably have eye issues, skeletal muscle issues. If it was Fabre's, you probably have some skin stuff, some more neuropathy, kidney involvement. So what do you have in a 74-year-old? And you're getting a lot of signals here that this is an infiltrate of cardiomyopathy and not just more muscle. The um, EKG voltage may be a little low for the proportion of LV wall thickness. The elevated troponin could come from infiltration into the heart muscle. The low blood pressure could come from autonomic dysfunction from nerve involvement from the infiltration. The carpal tunnel and spinal stenosis that this patient have could also come from an infiltrative disease. So what's a unifying diagnosis that gives someone heart muscle infiltration, nerve infiltration, and orthopedic infiltration like lumbar spinal stenosis and carpal tunnel syndrome? That would lead to the last item on our differential, amyloidosis. So that's where we are next. And tell me, Laura, if you want me to go through the next set of imaging studies. Yes, yes that would be awesome. Yeah. Great. 
So I should not have unshared my screen because now I have to go through and talk out loud to you as I do stepwise approach to screen sharing. Okay, here we go. Share screen, PowerPoint. Okay, great. So blah, 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 echo, chest x-ray, the money shot. And you know, you hear from all your teachers that you should not just look at the report, but look at the images. You know, I think when it comes to an echocardiogram for potential cardiac amyloidosis, a picture really is worth a thousand words. Like you just look at this and say, something, something is very wrong here. And the more you look at, the more you realize what that something very wrong is. Um, okay, so uh, global longitudinal strain. So global longitudinal strain is a measure you can do on echocardiograms it, because you can do this deformation analysis, like what's the percent deformation. It reflects the function of the subendocardial uh, sub longitudinal fibers, which are more, most prone to wall stress. So if you longitudinal strain should be negative and it should be really negative. So this is like a, a map of what the longitudinal strain is. And um, the classic pattern you hear in patients with amyloidosis is the cherry on top, which means the strain is normal at the apex. That's the center of the screen here. That's why it's red and less normal as you go outwards. I mean, people put a lot of stock into this, but my take home is it's okay if your echo lab doesn't do this because your, your differential diagnosis is going to live or die on whether there's global longitudinal strain. So what do you want to do next? You think the patient is cardiac amyloidosis based on their clinical presentation. Now you have to cement the diagnosis. And to do that, one thing you need is a technetium pyrophosphate scan. So this is a bone scintigraphy study that for reasons that are not entirely clear, these bone avid compounds light up in patients with amyloidosis. Now we're going to talk about, is that TTR or AL? which are the two major forms that affect the heart. Um, but this is, a, this is this patient's technetium pyrophosphate scan. So how do we measure it? You see the heart there kind of in the center of the screen is really bright. And you, that's a planar image. You see the cross-sectional image on the right where you're also looking at rib uptake. So you have, what you do is you measure the heart to contralateral lung, which one's brighter? I mean, it's not really rocket science. And the heart to contralateral lung, H to CL ratio is 1.7, that's abnormal. And then you look at how bright is the heart compared to the lung, to the ribs. If only the ribs are bright, that's really negative. If they're both equally bright, that's pretty negative. If the heart's bright, as bright or brighter than the ribs, that's positive, grade three uptake. So this is a glaringly positive technetium pyrophosphate scan. But wait, there's more. As I said, there are really only two forms of amyloidosis that really impact the heart. The TTR form, transthyretin, and the AL form. And the prognosis the treatments differ dramatically. They differ catastrophically. So if you miss a diagnosis of AL and say, oh, the patient is just TTR, you have done your patient a terrible, catastrophic, potentially fatal disservice. So if you have a positive technetium pyrophosphate scan, how do you know if it's AL or TTR? You know, because you never, ever, ever order the technetium pyrophosphate scan without also ordering a monoclonal light chain screen. A monoclonal light chain screen in this case must involve serum and urine, immunofixation electrophoresis, and serum-free light chains. And we see in this patient that the immunofixation electrophoresis showed a paraprotein migrating as IgG with kappa light chains, and the kappa lambda ratio was elevated. So now we don't know. Is this TTR, because the technetium scan was positive? Is it TTR plus AL because the monoclonal light chain screen is positive? Is it just AL with a false positive technetium scan? This is a situation where you have to biopsy. You must, must, must biopsy the patient and you want to biopsy the affected organ. This patient had an endomyocardial biopsy, which confirmed cardiac amyloidosis. And then it was sent for the liquid chromatography mass spectroscopy that's often a send out to the Mayo Clinic. And it showed the transthyretin type with the V122I mutation. 
So this is really, so there's, there's so much to be said here. Remember that father who died of a heart attack at 61? You have to wonder, was this really hereditary to begin with? And it's very important to figure out genetic or not when you have TTR because the therapies differ dramatically. So now, Laura, I have two slides of going through an overview of how we make the diagnosis. Uh, is it okay to go through them now? Yes, sounds amazing. Okay, fantastic. So, I'm having fun. so much fun. This is oh, amazing. Me too, me too. Is there any more fun topic in the whole entire world? Not that I know. So, you know, I think seeing classic cases in morning report is so critical because the best way you learn is from experience and the best experience is seeing your patient, but you can't see all the patients. So getting a story of a patient that fixes in your mind is so critical because it'll aid you in your differential as you treat other patients. So let me go through an overview of cardiac amyloidosis, highlighting the important points from this case. So cardiac amyloidosis, Protein infiltrates the myocardium, causing a restrictive cardiomyopathy. Remember, there's two sources, AL, light chains, a form of a plasma cell dyscrasia, or the TTR protein. The TTR protein can come from one of two places, a mutation in the gene, or wild type. Very important to make that distinction because certain therapies are only approved for the variant form when there's a mutation, and there can be implications for offspring and age alone will never allow you to distinguish between the two because there can be delayed presentation. So just because a patient's 80 doesn't mean you shouldn't still do genetic testing. And remember that the protein just doesn't infiltrate the heart, it infiltrates other places, the nerves, the kidneys uniquely in AL, the GI tract and orthopedic issues. So what I want you to remember is when a patient has multiple seemingly disparate findings, there may be an ultimate unifying diagnosis. So when you come to TTR amyloid, consider heart failure symptoms, the tip of the iceberg. Think about other nonspecific stuff like fatigue, cardiac disease, this patient had AFib, Interestingly, if you look at clinical series of patients with aortic stenosis or hef PEF, garden variety heart failure with preserved EF, about 15% actually have cardiac amyloidosis, a missed opportunity for diagnosis. Remember, not LDH, increased wall thickness, because that'll force you to figure out if that increased wall thickness is muscle or infiltration. And the QRS voltage might not be classically low. It's only classically low in like 30% of cases, not very sensitive, but it might be discordant. Think about neuropathies. This patient had autonomic dysfunction. That's so weird. On high dose Losartan forever, all of a sudden doesn't tolerate it. Something's funny. Carpal tunnel, spinal stenosis are classic and often predate the diagnosis of cardiac disease by five to seven years. The higher your index of suspicion, the earlier you will initiate treatment, the better the patient will do. Let's go through the algorithm, which we followed in this patient. We took our clues from our history, our ECG, our echocardiogram, and then we used that to do the monoclonal light chain screen and a technetium pyrophosphate scan. Now remember, a few important points. I memorized in medical school that the way to diagnose light, monoclonal light chain disease was SPEP and UPEP. Actually, no. SPEP, not sensitive enough. You have to do immunofixation, electrophoresis, or you could miss a monoclonal light chain that's causing AL amyloidosis. Second point, I memorized in medical school that if you're looking for amyloid, do a fat pad biopsy. No, fat pad biopsy is actually terribly insensitive for TTR. So if there's any potential suspicion of that, you've got to go for the organ in question, the heart or the kidneys. Is it more invasive? Yes, but being more invasive is better than missing the diagnosis. Next point, technetium pyrophosphate scans are a huge boon to the world because back when I was in medical school, you had to biopsy everyone to make a diagnosis. No longer, you can diagnose TTR amyloid non-invasively with your technetium pyrophosphate scan, but it's only diagnostic if the light chains are negative. So remember these points, take those clues and you know, you'll find, I predict, that the more heightened awareness you have for this condition, it almost seems like everyone has it on some level. So be very mindful of those clues. Do the tests in the right order so you will make the right diagnosis. What's the word, Dr. Thomas? Yes. <laughs> And that's, that's every passionate thing okay. I wanted to tell you about cardiac amyloidosis. Tell me, uh, what comes next? Thank you so much. That was really helpful learning about your algorithm diagnostic approach. And I really liked how 
before when we were looking through the patient, you match like your illness scripts for amyloid versus sarcoid and kind of seeing what clues the patient had and then seeing if it matched what you're, what we know or we think typically that amyloid has. And then that kind of made us think more about amyloid versus other infiltrative diseases that we talked about in our differential. Um, I think I have a question and then we can um, have um, Laura jump back in if there's any more information for the case. I know for this patient specifically, there was a lot of different clues and at like the carpal tunnel and other things. And as you were saying, a lot of patients that present with like half of unknown etiology might have like underlying amyloid and it's not necessarily like diagnosed as much as, as we know that it is common. So how do you kind of, what, what things do you look for in a patient that might not have these other symptoms to kind of think that like, or have like a high suspicion for amyloid in the first place to begin with? such an important point because you know HEFPEF, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, is in a way a bit of a wastebasket diagnosis. You're short of breath, your ejection fraction is preserved, oh you must have HEFPEF. But to stop there is, is problematic in, in many ways. You know, first of all, you could have volume overload from something totally else. Maybe it's really the liver's fault. Maybe it's the kidney's fault, nephrotic syndrome or renal dysfunction. So just to blame the heart when it might just be an innocent bystander, first you do yourself a disservice. So step one, when you have a patient with volume overload is to ask yourself, is it the heart, the liver or the kidneys? Because that's generally where the volume overload is gonna come from. The second question then is if you're settled on the fact that it's the heart is well, is it something driving it? Is it like a valvular lesion? Is it a pericardial lesion? Again, think about the structures in the heart that even if the ejection fraction is preserved, could still give you volume overload. Is the muscle just stiff because there's too much muscle or something infiltrating the muscle? Is, are there valve problems like aortic stenosis, mitral stenosis, uh, tricuspid regurgitation? Is there something like, uh, uh, as we mentioned, the pericardium, is, is there something like um, a obstructive lesion in the heart that could be causing it, like a myxoma, something crazy like that? So you have to really think through that diff or high output heart failure. You have to think through that differential when you're, and then often only if you've crossed every treatable, potentially reversible, addressable cause, cardiac cause of volume overload, can you resign yourself to saying, ah, they have garden variety heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And the second thing to remember is diseases have rhythms, right? Every patient you take care of, every disease generally has a rhythm. And the rhythm of garden variety, hef pef, is they're kind of fine and they're punctuated by an exacerbation and then they go to being fine again. So it's that generally elderly female patient with hypertension, diabetes, obesity, atrial fibrillation, coronary disease, who has to take an NSAID because her knee hurts and then comes into the hospital really short of breath, mostly left-sided heart failure. You give her a little bit of Lasix and boom, she feels amazing. She goes and she's fine. As opposed to a patient with something like cardiac amyloidosis, the rhythm of cardiac amyloidosis is very different. The trajectory is more of a progressive inexorable decline. So they're doing okay, and now they're feeling worse, and they're feeling even worse, and they're coming into the hospital, but they're leaving not feeling much better, and there's no clear precipitant. There wasn't an NSAID or a huge salty meal, and then they keep coming back. And not only are they having these exacerbations, but they're showing you other signs of end organ dysfunction with, with worsening blood pressure with worsening renal function, cardiorenal syndrome, hypotension, the whole clinical context feels worse. The other thing to keep in mind is if they don't have hypertension, that makes sense. They don't have significant obesity that kind of fits with that HEFPEF clinical context. So I, I, I think um, looking to the rhythm of the disease, the past medical history, demographic information, and then making sure with every patient you've gone through your algorithm of, of taking away the treatable, potentially reversible, intervenable cardiac causes. Oftentimes an echo is all you need or an echo plus a good history will really help you ferret out between those, those causes. Thank you so much. That was so helpful to think through the approach and kind of what clues there are to guide us when we're thinking about amyloid and other things on the differential. If anyone has any questions at all for Dr. Kittleson, feel free to put it in the chat so we can ask her. Um, I'll turn it back to you, Laura, if you have any, um, any more information and then we can um, go to Shema for teaching points as well. 
Um, I have just the like the the final what happened to this patient. Um, um, patient started on. I don't know, I'm sorry if I don't pronounce it right, but Tafamidis and enrolled in a clinical trial of a new agent. It 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 plums. I'm sorry, Dr. Crudison, how do I, do I say this? Oh, Can oh you my gosh, they make them sound actually much better than they are. And it's funny, I had to um I had to interview someone for this American College of Cardiology podcast once. I had to interview one of like the godfathers of um of the SGLT2 inhibitors. And listen, I asked him before we started, I'm like, can you please tell me how you, how you, is it, is it soda glyphosate or soda glyphosate? And so listen, you're, you're not alone. I, I do the same thing. So to famidus, so to famidus, so when you think, okay, let's go back to our uh, pathophysiology will also guide treatment options. So if you have someone with this amyloid fibril infiltrating into the myocardium, how could we treat the patient? We could try to resorb and suck out those fibrils. We could prevent the amyloid protein from forming the bad, the TTR protein from forming the bad fibrils that go into the myocardium, or we could prevent the formation of the TTR protein to begin with. Okay, so sucking out the protein from the from the heart, that is um, theoretically very appetizing. Well, appetizing is the wrong word. Theoretically very very wonderful, but not ready for prime time. So put that aside. You can't resorb the protein. What about the two other whites? What about stabilizing the protein? That would be like take the protein so, and stabilize it so it can't form these fibrils and go in. Okay, so stabilizing is one way. And the second way would be just stop the production in the first place. And that would be a silencer. So the two main areas of therapy we have are stabilizers and silencers. The stabilizers came to great fanfare with the ATTRACT trial, which came out in the New England Journal. The study was first presented in 2018. And it showed you take about 440 patients with TTR amyloidosis and cardiac involvement. You give half of them or two thirds to famidus, it's two to one ratio, and the rest placebo. And remarkably over 30 months, you have an absolute reduction in mortality of 13%. And you have about a 30% reduction in heart failure hospitalizations. Important things from the ATTRACT trial of Tefamidus. Number one, it took 18 months for the survival curves to celebrate, to separate. That makes sense because it stops, it doesn't prevent what's already there. It just stops additional infiltration. It stabilizes the protein that's not yet in the heart. So it takes a while before you're gonna see a benefit. Second, the benefit was far greater the less sick you were, which is why earlier diagnosis is so important. If you're really advanced with New York Heart Association symptoms, advanced disease, then you're not gonna benefit as much. So Tefamidus is the best we've got, this TTR stabilizer give to patients. Um, it, the list price is something like $250,000 a year because I don't know, drug companies have economics that as a cardiologist, I don't understand. But fortunately, through magical assistance programs and insurance, it's generally at an affordable amount for many patients. But the elephant in the room, of course, is the financial toxicity of many of these medicines. So Tefaminus is the best we've got. What about these silencers? What about these mRNA doohickeys that prevent the production of the TTR protein to begin with? Well, they've been shown in the variant form of TTR amyloid with neuropathy that they can actually reduce the progression of neuropathy, which can be absolutely debilitating in some of these patients. But, and there's some surrogate endpoints that maybe it helps the heart, but there are ongoing randomized trials as we speak of using silencers in patients with cardiomyopathy from TTR, looking at the endpoints we care about, cardiovascular death and hospitalizations. And one of them, the cardio transform trial. It's very clever. It's cardio TTR transform. Yeah, I don't know who thinks of these things. So the cardio transform trial is what this particular patient was enrolled in with Eplantercin, which is a new TTR silencer. So I think the jury is out. So many things we don't know. We don't know is a silencer going to be better than a stabilizer? Is a silencer and a stabilizer going to be given together? I mean, that's theoretically very appropriate because they attack TTR in different ways. And certainly in this trial, patients can remain on standard of care to famidus as they get the silencer. And then what happens when we get too good at diagnosis? What happens when we can diagnose people when they barely have any symptoms or no symptoms or asymptomatic gene carriers, offspring? What do we do with them? 
No one quite knows. Uh, but for now, it's so important to make the diagnosis and make it early. You can institute that defamatis as soon as possible. And you have to prepare the patient. You have to be realistic with the patient. You're probably not going to feel better, but my hope is you don't feel worse. That's the way the stabilizers work. Great, thank you. That was so helpful. And we have actually two people asking similar questions about cardiac MRI. If there's any specific signs on cardiac MRI, since usually sometimes that's pursued after an echo to define the etiology of heart failure. And then the other question is, should we do CMR with gadolinium before doing the technetium scan? Oh, such a good question. Now, I wrestle with this a lot. I wrestle with the tension between just wanting to know everything. Like, I want to know what every test shows, because why not? And, you know, not just the cost, but putting the patient through the study. I've never had a cardiac MRI, but patients tell me you're like in a dark tube for 45 minutes where you can't move and barely breathe, and it sounds really loud and uncomfortable. So you think I could take that. Every time you order, every time you sign an order, it's a huge ordeal for the patient. They gotta drive there, they gotta check in, they gotta take time off from work, they have to arrange their, they have to sit in the tube. So you just want to get an IV. So you have to make sure they really, really need it. So here's my take on cardiac MR. If I have a patient who I am just 100% convinced it is classic amyloidosis, we have the carpal tunnel and the spinal stenosis and the autonomic dysfunction, and that heart is thick, I go straight to the technetium pyrophosphate scan plus monoclonal light chain screen because my index of suspicion is so high. When do I go to an MRI first? I go to an MRI first if I think there's something funny going on, but I'm not sure what that funny thing is. Like, maybe I'm thinking about a constrictive pericarditis type of picture. Maybe I'm thinking this could be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and I'm kind of confused. I can't quite tell based on the presentation if this is HCM versus amyloidosis. Maybe I'm worried about a myocarditis. Maybe they have also the connective tissue disease. And I'm like, well, gosh, maybe they've got a myocarditis related to that. Um, or, you know, it's I'm pretty sure it's HEFPEF but I know nah, maybe it could be amyl uh, sarcoid. So if I think it's sarcoid, hemochromatosis, um, myocarditis, constrictive pericarditis or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, if I think there's something funny going on, it's not a classic picture, I will start with the MRI. But in a way, if I get the MRI and it's rip roaring consistent, not diagnostic, consistent with cardiac amyloidosis, honestly, I feel kind of bad. I'm like, gee, should I have known that and just skip this and gone straight to what I need? Um, I have had, you know, okay, let's take a different patient, a middle-aged woman who has a history of conduction system disease, reduced EF, and was told at some point she might have an abnormal chest x-ray, but no one kind of ever bothered to work her up. She's got kind of a cough. Then I might start with a cardiac MRI, looking for sarcoid on my way to an FDG PET scan, looking for active sarcoid. But I take a 74-year-old guy with lumbar spinal stenosis and carpal tunnel and autonomic dysfunction, a little bit of an elevated troponin and a history of AFib and six sinus. You know, my, it's your, what you learn in medical school is the 100 items on the differential. What you learn in training and beyond is how you weight those items based on the clinical context. So that's, that's how I would approach it. Thank you. That was really helpful when we're thinking about diagnostic tests, looking at what utility they'll have and how they'll add to like the overall clinical picture. We'll turn it back to you, Laura, if there's anything else for the case and otherwise the shame for teaching. Well, that's, that's it for me. Thank you so much, Dr. Kittison. It was really, really fun. You are such a fun person, like to be around. <laughs> Only when I'm talking um, about cardiology, I'm very boring otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And let's go with Shima for the teaching points. Mm. Oh, hello, everyone. It was such a great case and such a great discussion. And I learned so much through the whole teaching points. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Killison. So I will start with the teaching points. So we had a patient with exertional dyspnea as a chief complaint, and we learned that we should always start with the pathophysiology. So think, is the heart involved? And think of the, any muscle disease like cardiomyopathy, are the arteries uh, involved, the valves, the electrical system, and next to the heart, it can also be the lung as we learn, or it can be anything in, within the blood like anemia or any de decondition. And uh, putting the framework for the case at the beginning, we have um, a CAD together with atrial fibrillation. We're thinking, is this any coronary disease or arrhythmia or a sick sinus syndrome? 
And what we learned is always to make a proper examination. So consider the GVP, GVP, JVP, so is it elevated? And also an S3 is usually a bad sign. And within the lung, if we hear crackle, it can be a telectasis, but also a refractory heart failure. And putting the first clues for a case, um, thinking of like prednisone can lead to fluid retention. And if we have a family history of heart attack, it doesn't, um, a heart attack is a very generalized or superficial term. So we have to think it can be due to myocardial infarction or any kind of arrhythmia. And um, an elevation of GV JVP and BNP, uh, let us think more about a cardiomyopathy than uh, an arrhythmia. And then we had thick walls and echo. And we were thinking of, okay, um, thick walls and echo can be due to more muscle like uh, LVH, um, which um, the main causes are like athlete's heart, or aortic stenosis, hypertension, and hypertrophic cardi cardiomyopathy. Or it can be an inf infiltrating heart disease like Fabry, amyloidosis, hemochromatosis, any storage disease, and sarcoidosis. And now collecting the clues for the infiltration in terms of amyloidosis, we had like trop trop troponin elevation, which is due to infiltration of the heart muscle, the low blood pressure due to autonomic dysfunction, because we learned that this amyloid doesn't only infiltrate the heart, it can also infiltrate other structures within the whole body, like the GI leading to diarrhea, and also nerves leading to sensory neuropathy. And for amyloidosis, the main forms involving the heart are um, transpiratin and um, AL amyloidosis due to plasma cell dyscrasia, which are both leading to restrictive cardiomyopathy. And for the diagnosis, consider a global longitudinal strain uh, where we can see apical sparing. And uh, what we also learned is a technetium pyrophosphate scan. So I always thought that we have to make biopsy in terms of amyloidosis, but it isn't always necessary. But consider technetium pyrophosphate scan is only done if the light chains are negative. And when we perform um, a, a monoclonal light chain screen, it is important to rather do immunofixation than SPE. SPEB because it's more sensitive because um, the SPEB, um, the monoclonal light chains can be missed in this form of technique. And also for the biopsy, what I always like is congratulating, just a pearl. And uh, as we also know, for volume overload, uh, it can be due to heart, liver, and kidney. And thinking of the heart, consider valvular, pericardial lesions, and any obstructive lesions like a myxoma. And for the treatment of amyloidosis, we have silencers and stabilizers. And usually uh, one part of diagnostic in this uh, infiltrative heart disease, we do uh, also cardiac MRI. So thank you very much. It was a very nice case. Wow, that was so great, Shema. Thank you so much for walking us through all the teaching points and pearls and kind of just recapping the whole case and how it came together. So thanks, thank you so much. And thanks for everyone for joining us and Dr. Kittleson for teaching us so much during this past hour. It's been so fun to learn, learn all of this with you. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks everyone. Bye everyone.